three easy ways to smash a Wahhabi. May Allah have mercy upon you. Throughout the book, several strategies and arguments were presented for defense and offense. Now, here are three cases, although already mentioned throughout the book in one way or another, that if used properly, one should be able to use any one of them to silence a Wahhabi swiftly and easily. So, three easy ways to smash a Wahhabi means to dispatch him easily. You always want to get out of the debate quickly. Because it's not our goal to debate. Right? But if we're going to, we're going to be good at it. That's what we're doing here. What are these three easy ways? The first is that we ask the Wahhabi what he says about the verse. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ it apparently means he is with you wherever you are. He will either take it literally or not. So memorize this ayah. If he takes it literally, he contradicted their creed of confirming the direction of highness for Allah. If he says that it means that Allah knows about everything everywhere, then just as he saw fit to interpret the verse in a way different from the apparent meaning to escape contradiction, we also make ta'wil for every verse and hadith that apparently implies that Allah is in a direction. For that is necessary for escaping contradiction. However, the difference between us and them is that we escape all contradictions while they are stuck with contradicting the verse, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing resembles him in any way. It may be said to him, what made it permissible for you to make ta'wil and made it forbidden for us? It may also be said to him, based on what rule did you make ta'wil for one verse and leave it for the other? That's because there's an obvious inconsistency, isn't there? So, impose it on him. Impose that inconsistency on him and don't be nervous about that. Listen, I'm not saying, you know, he can never be soft with anybody, of course. لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ مَقَالٍ They say in Arabic, لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ مَقَالٍ It means every situation has its own statement. That means you use wisdom. Sometimes you're soft, sometimes you're hard. But there's a lot of people out there who it's really like their belief and their feeling that they can tell you anything they want to tell you and that you should take it. So don't be one of those people. So it may be said to him, what made it permissible for you to make ta'wil and made it forbidden for us? It may also be said to him, based on what rule did you make ta'wil for one verse and leave it for the other? This deed of the Wahhabiyyah is called in Arabic Tahakkum, being arbitrary, picking and choosing. In other words, it is saying something without evidence. Do not let him move to another subject until he answers the question or submits to Ahlu Sunnah. So that's one easy way to smash a Wahhabi. Memorize this ayah. Wahua ma'akum aynama kuntum. There are others. Any mutashabi ayah that doesn't mean Allah is over the arsh. It means something else if you took it literally, you can use it. That's why the scholars said that no group of mushabbiha can refute another group. If they have different beliefs, neither of them can refute the other because they're all doing the same thing. They just, one group selected one uh, portion of mutashabi verses to take literally, and another group took a different portion of mutashabih verses to take literally. So the one who believes that Allah is everywhere, for example, the Wahhabi cannot really refute him because he's doing exactly what the Wahhabi does. And he cannot refute the Wahhabi because the Wahhabi is doing exactly what he is doing. The second is to immediately refer to the aforementioned hadith of Imran ibn Husayn. That's the name of this hadith. Hadith Imran ibn Husayn. 
كَانَ اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ غَيْرُهُ You should have memorized that one already. Allah existed and there was nothing other than Him. This is the second easy way to smash a Wahhabi. Go right for this hadith immediately. From the great strength of this hadith, you may refer to it before you mention any verse from the Qur'an. We talked about that. It's easier to debate with the Wahhabi with this hadith than with the ayah, Laysa kamithlihi shay. Because when it comes to Laysa kamithlihi shay, which means nothing is like him in any way, the Wahhabi says nothing is like Allah. He just doesn't understand what that means. So if you use Laysa kamithlihi shay, he's going to agree with you in word. He's going to agree with you in, in expression. He's going to say, yes, Laysa kamithlihi shay. And then you tell him, Allah is not like anything. He says, yes. You tell him, Allah is not a body. He will probably say, yes. We already talked about that. Some of them won't say yes. But likely, he will say yes. So don't start there. Go right to this hadith. Can Allah walam yakun shay'un Allah existed and there was nothing other than him. And he will have nothing. This hadith is a very mighty weapon against them. The way to use this hadith has already been explained in this section, proof from the hadith that refutes the Wahhabi creed. So review it there. If the Wahhabi says that he does not know the hadith, his ignorance does not change the fact that the hadith exists. So, so, so what? If he said, I don't know that hadith, I'm so. If it were me, and he said to me, I don't know that hadith, I would say to him, so what? And I would just stop, I would say it just like that. So what? And I'll see what does he say. And do not let him move to another point. If he claims that it is weak, it is very sahih. Narrated by Al-Bukhari in the chapter of Tawheed. And add that he should not talk without knowledge. He would dare to say that the hadith is weak. Even if he knows it's not weak, he might dare to say it. We know how they do. Out of desperation, he may claim that this hadith does not prove that Allah exists without a place or direction. As a simple claim. Meaning, you tell him this hadith and he'll say, Oh, that doesn't prove that Allah exists without a place. If so, tell him that it is not permissible to shut off his mind on purpose. The hadith is as clear as daybreak in negating the existence of anything with Allah eternally. And that includes places and directions. Allah existed and there was nothing other than Him. Can Allahu walam yakun shay'un ghayruh. The third way, and this is the last of these three ways, because even though it really is straight to the point, but you might not be able to use it with everyone because it's a little bit technical. The third way is to pose this question. Must the Muslim creed be built on something qat'i, definitive, or dhanni, speculative, or supposed? Should the evidence for Muslim belief be definitive or speculated and supposed, thought to, to be right, but not definitive? If he says speculative and he most likely will not say that if he understands what those words means he won't say that but if he did if he says the evidence for the muslim belief is speculative and supposed not definitive then his ignorance and stupidity will be obvious if he says that the creed must be built upon something definitive and not merely supposed, then we agree. But then say to him, how many meanings can istawa have? If he says that it can only have one meaning, then he is either a ruthless liar or a pathetic ignoramus. And if he confesses that it can have many possible meanings, then for him to choose rising above out of all the possible meanings is a speculation on his part. The secret of this point is in clarifying that speculation comes into play when there is more than one possibility for something. The rule the scholars used was 
إذا ثبت الاحتمال سقط القطع في الاستدلال If more than one possibility is confirmed then the certainty of the evidence is dropped It means someone brings you an ayah He tells you this ayah is d definitely proof for what I'm saying So if you're able to say to him but can't you explain this ayah like this and like this and like this if he says yes it can that means then you don't have a definitive evidence for this reason the real salaf used to say istawa as he described himself because that is definitive istawa they did not choose one meaning over the other because that would be what speculative that's something supposed for them to say definitively it means qahara to subdue or definitively it means hafiza to preserve that's a speculation why wasn't it the other one if he says qahara why wasn't it hafiza both of them work so how he chose one over the other and they did not say they definitely did not say rose above as he ascribed himself the scholars of the salaf they said istawa as for the verse laysa kamithlihi shay nothing resembles him in any way it can only have one meaning so it is definitive and thus the creed is built upon it and allah knows best and he grants the success